right, welcome back to Super Metal Brothers. The prodigal son has returned, a.k.a. Josh Rivero. Oracle Spectre, a.k.a. The Blackened Bard, has returned. Thank you. Glad to have you on. Glad to have me on here. (laughs) (laughs) Dang it! Dude, I'm so stoked to be on here. The Black and Bard podcast, dude. So, Thank you for having me on here, bro. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. For those at home, it's just me and the boy, Josh, good friend of the podcast. Um, my brother, he is currently somewhere in Costa Rica getting numerous trains ran on him. Nah, and man. I love he's that the, for He's him. at the Big Diddy party. So for the viewers at home or if you're listening on Spotify today, again, I have Josh from Oracle Spectre, and we are going to be diving extensively, I hope, into the new album, Deceivers. Eight tracks. Josh sent me a complete breakdown of each track with lyrics, what the lyrics and the story means, and thoroughly enjoyed reading through that. And there's a lot of things I want to dissect. So my hope is, if we have time, is I kind of want to just go track by track and really kind of like discover your philosophy, because there's a lot of uh, interesting storytelling within the album that I found pretty fascinating. Uh, we're going to just kind of freeform and shoot the shit a little bit before we get into that. Yeah, man, before we get into it, first off, I wanted to say uh, thank you for being a guest judge on our Metal Combat series, dude. That was a lot of fun. We enjoyed that was having fun. you. Yeah, um, honestly, I, uh, I I thought it was a very interesting experience to kind of go back and then, like hear two bands who their talent vastly outweighs their composition that they had brought forth on those two songs because i know that they are they're, they're capable of better because i've heard better from them i actually went through and listened to some other other their other stuff um, yeah and i'm like oh well that's why i was really in for it for dex core dude because everything we had listened to previously up to that point was stellar um love bites just isn't really my jam dude it's like iron maiden already exists in dragon force it's like i don't really need more of that in my life but i mean they're gonna appeal to a vaster audience than someone like dexcore would but um my true love has always been metalcore hardcore but anyways thanks for doing that man um <laughs> totes so, uh actually that's a good segue uh what's kind of got you fired up lately as far as metal goes what have you been jamming lately let me check let me check let's see i got oh my cat just opened the door like he pays the bills so i'm gonna give you one that i don't think you might have heard of have you heard of mirar m-i-r-r yeah dude so i everybody's been telling me that i need to check them out i think i caught a snippet of them it's like very dark fall to my understanding yeah Um, that's I've I've been on uh, the Mirror hype train since they first dropped uh, Lestat like way back in like I think it was maybe last like two years ago now. Uh, my God, I, I nobody's made anything like like Mirror, and I actually um, I'm looking forward to uh, like more of their stuff. They just dropped a new EP called Mare. Very just if you want some of just the pristine. The most just, it's pristine. It's dark. It's horrifying. It's abrasive, but it's it's also almost like a showcase of force. Like if you th- if you think knocked loose is hard, Mirror they take that and they just oh, it's just like abrasively in your face. Yeah, it, 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 there, it, it's kaiju music. Kaiju, it's yeah. kaiju music. <laughs> yeah, kaiju core. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I'll give um, give a shout out to to Worm, not Worm Shepherd, Worm, the band Worm. Okay. Uh, they have a uh, song called or some QS. Uh, I can't quite read it. There's a little chat here to the right to you here. Can put it next to. Let me see. This one. Oh, this, fuck. I don't know how to read that, dude. It's okay. Some, some QS funeral. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. TikTok put me onto that song, and I'm like, oh shit. It's it's like I I genuinely feel like I'm ascending listening to something like that. It was it was almost like um. You know the you know death the band death right yeah 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 okay I just I, I know they're huge another huge band but I just you never know you never know um their uh, top song uh I can't believe I forgot it. it's uh, something of souls yeah I haven't yeah. listened to much death to no be like th- it, it's it what? feels like death came back and reincarnated in, voice in, of the in, soul Is that voices of the soul yes 
Oh my God. It's just like that. So those are the two bands that I'll, I'll put into the spotlight. Nice, dude. I've been holding off listening to Marar because people won't have, you know, asked me to uh, react to it. So I want to go in just completely blind. I think I caught like a snippet. Um, the, it got like the seal of approval from Simone Pietro Forte, which is like, if you get that, like you're, I'm sure a stellar band. Bro, he got the they they uh Nick Nocturnal reacted to him. Most uh, times. okay. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I don't see much of his reactions. I always felt like he just like kind of picks and chooses reactions. Well, it's to, not like, on his main channel, it's on his Twitch clips channel. Ah, uh, that's smart. Yeah. Dude, YouTube's such a weird realm. Like it's not something I really give a fuck about. You know what I mean? Because I'm not trying to be like some ultra mega fucking youtuber necessarily it's just a fun thing i like to do but um like people get too concerned with like reacting to certain things you know what i mean because it might not bring in enough uh views which could potentially hurt their channel like if you consistently have videos that are kind of duds it can kind of take you out of the algorithm and i respect that I still respect it, but something I've kind of learned in the course of doing this, like, cause we went through that whole Japanese metal phase and we like to use that, the metal combat thing as a device to like discover, you know, genres that we wouldn't normally. Right. So whether that's like fall or, you know, black, you know, traditional black and metal or whatever it may be. I found like we started getting a lot of, you know, subscribers from, you know, Japan and because of that, you know, then we do, they love watching our Hannah B.A. or Love Bites reactions or whatever. But the second we do, like, I don't know, a distant reaction, like half your fucking subscribership aren't even watching your shit. You know what I mean? Like, so you got to be, you kind of have to condition your audience. That's why I'm always like, I'm just going to listen to whatever the fuck, despite if it's big or not. I like discovering music. So I don't really care if it's going to bring in views or not. You have to condition your your tribe, so to speak. But um, yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. Because like, if you look at it, the type of person that you are attracts the type of people that you're around. And same goes with the type of music that you make, the type of music that you react to. And so if, if you want to bring in a more underground band, bring in a more underground crowd, there you go. Yeah, exactly. I've become more concerned with, but like in the opposite way. I don't want to get audience captured by like certain demographics. I want to be able to do whatever I want to do when I do it. But enough about me and my stupid YouTube channel. Your YouTube uh, channel is not stupid. I, I legitimately <laughs> love when you up- upload. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. I always admire your ability to just stay based as fuck. And this kind of goes back to like what we're jamming. You had posted something about Bring Me the Horizon's new album and how Fantano fell off. Um, So here's the thing with Bring Me the Horizon. And I listened to the new album. I think it's good. I, You know what it is? I compare it to the new Dune movie, if you've seen Dune 2 yet. I haven't. I haven't seen. uh, I've only seen part of Dune 1 and I haven't seen uh, Dune 2 yet. Okay. I won't spoil anything, but good movie good album if i'm comparing it to bring me the horizon but i feel like a lot of people are like treating it like the second coming of christ and i'm just like "Eh, it's all right so walk me through why you thought that album was so great for a bring me album you have to start with the artist's intention they went by and they were like all right so the first album that the first part of the EP, uh, post human, uh, that they did like back in 2020, 2021 or so, I forget the year. Yeah. Um, that one was them wanting to go forward and put forward in something. They want to bring, uh, a, a new, their new sound that they want to do, but with how they wanted to tackle post human next gen, they're like, okay, this one is now go instead of it being the future, this is the past. And so what the whole idea is that they're taking inspiration from a video game called Parasite. Uh, I think it's called Parasite Eve or something like that. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. That's a but great anyway, one. yeah. And so what they wanted to do is they wanted to really capture uh, the sound of uh, 2000s uh, hardcore uh, metalcore. And, and they really like wanted to capture. Hardcore. Exactly. They wanted to capture 
uh, honestly, what I believe is like a time capsule genre nowadays. And a lot of people don't uh, hear that anymore because everyone's so focused on trying to make, you know, the the hardest, the most intense breakdown possible. I mm-hmm. mean, guilty as charged. I love right. doing that. It's so much fun, yeah. especially <laughs> when you're able to put it in context with the song. Sort of di- diverting. That's why I think that um, Disembodied Tyrant, uh, their breakdown on uh, Death Empress Oof. is... Yeah, we just talked is, about... Yeah, that is the perfect breakdown, and I think it's going to go down as as the like textbook breakdown for the the coming decade. Because, dude, that's so crazy you said that. Because I was like, I don't know if you watched our episode we did with Sinistia, but uh, we had mm-hmm. Sinistia on last time, and um, we were basically sucking their dick over that ep and the breakdowns yeah. in it and especially death empress dude that would that, like set a new benchmark oh, for yeah. breakdowns for me and but if you went on the subreddit the deathcore subreddit discussing it dude they thought the consensus was that the breakdowns were the weakest part of that ep and i'm like are you fucking insane dude i'm just flabbergasted dude that's like ever since then like i really take just people in general's like metal opinions for like with a fat grain of salt i can see an argument for that being the case because it is focusing on raw brutality rather than it being something that can be rhythmically in tune with what's going on something that it can work uh in the pit something something along those lines because they are going to be playing live they are going to be playing that track live 100 percent. but you need to understand something is that within the context of the song that is the moment where they're literally like within the context of the song that is the end of the death empress that is the end of the death empress within the song and so that's like boom that's how everything caps off anyways back to bring me the horizon bring me the horizon and how they brought forth this old sound and then rejuvenate and brought life back into it it's such a satisfying aesthetic and it's just it's just a sonic smorgasbord of how all the lyrics are are talking about uh this story of in you know an ai called eve that essentially is poisoning humanity and breaking it down piece by piece and how there's uh the this human uh, that is trying to break free from this uh, this virus that it's been uh, bringing around. And I think the I, I thought I was going to hate that album because mm-hmm. one of the first tracks I think I remember hearing was, was Parasite Eve. And considering that it was like, you know, right around the time when the pandemic was at its worst, yeah. uh, I did not want to hear where the first track of a song is, uh, I have a fever, don't breathe on me. And I'm like, oh, mm, no, this yeah. song's <laughs> Yeah, this is a bit cringe. Oh, yeah. A little on the nose, dude. Yeah, but, but no, the, sure. I, I think that now that I've gotten older and we are we've uh, we're in a much safer place. Now that I've gotten older and we're in a much safer place and we're uh, as far away from COVID nineteen as uh, we can we can get. Um, I don't know it still exists, but anyways, I think Parasite Eve is a very 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 beautiful track about just the doom that's happening within the the story. I think that uh, when uh, Anthony Fantano uh, did one he of his review biggest, it? He did. He gave it a three. Oh, Jesus Christ, dude. Yeah. See, <laughs> I was I was on board. I'm like, oh, I'm a ride or die Anthony Fantano. He gave Sleep Token a two. Fuck yeah. But then he gave he gave a uh, post human next gen a three. And what I got out of it is because he basically read the title of the album as next gen. And then he heard everything sound like everything that was in the 2000s. He's like, this isn't next gen. And so he didn't like it. He didn't. He literally did not get it. I've been talking yeah. with this with like other like like music people that I uh, talk with on like a Discord and stuff like that, and we're all like, no, it, it, like Anthony didn't get it, and we, I, I love Dude. I love that album. I, I give it I was like say. I give it like maybe like an eight. I give it like an eight out of ten, which okay. mind you means I love the album. Yeah, I would give it personally like a six or seven, dude. And like, and we'll even talk about this with your album. These, but reactions and listening to songs for the first time for me, or even the first couple times, is kind of a paradox because I find myself some of the songs I love the most throughout life, like I didn't like at first. It takes a while to really dissect it in my brain to make sense of it all over time. Just like time. what I said with Parasite Eve. Yeah. So um, 
But fan, as far as like Fantano's concerned, I don't know when it happened, but I think the dude's kind of a hack, to be totally honest. Honestly, dude, I think he'll negatively review popular shit for the controversy of it. And because no, even like, no, 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 listen, no, no, listen, listen, listen. Because even if we're going back to Sleep Token, right? Now, I'll be the first one to tell you that Sleep Token was mid as fuck last year okay but it's just that right now if we had more songs like the summoning it would have been a phenomenal album but that's not what we got no no summoning summoning, i think summoning is like it's it's the best song on the album but it's like a five out of ten because it switches it switches up so hard towards the end i hate that i hate regardless the to give that album a two out of ten dude is fucking absurd to me it's so wild like it like i'd even fully understand like because i'd watched his review on that and it i didn't truly understand the justifications for it you know what it is i think about Mm -hmm. fantano dude is he over analyzes shit to like its detriment i think no okay no 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 see here here's where here's where we're gonna need to flip things on its head um charlie xex recently dropped an album called brat have you heard of it no okay so charlie xex is right now climbing up on the on the album charts climbing up on the uh the song charts she is really really up there right now in fact she is climbing up uh so far on the charts right now that in the uk uh, she is number three right now, and she is actually threatening to take Taylor Swift's spot uh, of her album on number one. And that scared the shit out of Taylor Swift so much that she- Taylor Swift is launching a UK mm. version of her album to keep Charlie out of the number one spot. Damn. And yeah, so this album is hella popular and Fantano gave it a 10. So it, it doesn't have to be popular. He, he I think he genuinely gives like a, his opinion. And it's his, and that is definitely how he gives it. But I do think that when it came down to things like, like when it came down to how he reviewed uh, Lowe's out album, he gave that a six. He gave Post Human uh, a three. He gave. Uh, do you know who Vain FM is? I yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah, he gave. Uh, he gave one of their albums. Um, I think he gave both of their albums that they came out with uh, sixes and then Frontier. So do you was, think he's just out of touch with like that style of music? You think I, I think he has a preference <clears throat> and what I think he is uh, lacking, which is something that I don't think he's ever going to be able to get is experience within uh, the sonic field of metal. Uh, because when it comes down to it, uh, Anthony needs to really dive deep into how metal functionally works and uh, converse more with people who have delved deep into this uh, genre because it is such a fucking deep piece uh, to get into. Yeah, and for sure. The albums that I have seen him uh, give like really high ratings are really, really good. But they're not anything that I would really see myself going back and listening to over and over again because it's not what, I don't know, personally I would get into. But I still enjoy listening to Nails. I still enjoy listening to Behemoth, uh, O oh, oh Father, O oh Son, O oh Satan. Those are great albums. Um, but to, to, to cap it off, to cap it off, because um, I don't want to keep yapping, I yeah, yeah. just think that – uh, Anthony needs to uh, do what Brad Taste in Music has been doing, where uh, Brad actually has uh, moderators mm. that he will bring on who will share uh, metal music with him and ex- and uh, who are uh, huge fans of deathcore and metalcore and all that. And they'll share their favorite albums or their favorite tracks and they will actually go on and talk with him. It's like, hey, here's what this song's about. Here's all the things you need to understand it. And then Kind of like when you're learning a new Give all the context. Yes. You understand the context behind how it all works. And it just breathes new life into it. One of the mods, actually two of the mods I take back, two of the mods that uh, Brad Taste in Music has, they both said that my uh, album Deceivers was up there for as a contender for album of the year for them. And that really made me happy. I would know Brad gave it... Yeah, even though Brad gave, Brad gave it a sixty-five out of a hundred, they both gave it like an eight and a nine. It was yeah, but dude, to get a, I feel like 
to get someone who's not really a metal listener to give you a 65 out of 100 is probably a big deal in my yeah, he, opinion he said that too he, he says he hates metalcore but he he really digs like how the album went he gave a I'll, I'll tell you what the, the scores he gave each one was because honestly i'm a kind of i'm not gonna yeah. lie anyway yeah yeah <laughs> um the last point i'll make on fantano and this is why i said i think he overanalyzes shit okay um okay. that popular country song last year i forget the dude's name but the was it richmond north of richmond Aaron song? lewis or, yeah, yeah 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 that was popular on youtube or whatever so he did like a analysis of that song right and i think some of it was just him thinking partisanly if that's a word he was trying to allude to all these like racist dog whistles within the song he even brought up like the the mason dixon line and shit that's like never even mentioned in the song mm. and it's like dude did you ever just stop to think that like north richmond north of richmond just is clever and rhymes and maybe it's like nothing more than that like dude i feel like yeah this jar of pickles they the pickle juice they use is like the vinegar from north carolina so therefore the pickles are racist or some shit dude it's like you, uh, you miss the forest for the trees sometimes shit some shit's just simple there's not a yeah. deep meaning to certain things, dude. His his problem with the song isn't necessarily like th- that whole thing, what it is. He understands it. He gets where that is. The biggest problem is the lyric um, that involves um, the the obese milking where welfare and talking using that that specific lyric was yeah. what kind of brought out uh, the worst in people or the worst of people. And when a lot of the uh, of far right and and the right were using that song as like an anthem for them to literally like walk out into like debates and stuff like that. And a lot of like people in the right were going out and uh, and who, who correlate within uh, the uh, the right um, I- ideologies were really, 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 really loving that song and mm-hmm. and pushing that song forward it kind of shows that the problem wasn't that that song in of itself was coming from a bad place it came from a very good place and a very honest area the problem it's just so many bad faith people attach themselves to it close that's that's the first that's the that is the the end of it the beginning of it is the fact that he didn't think his uh lyrics all the way through and they were misconstrued and he genuinely ended up getting he ended up saying the wrong thing uh, as an example uh, the ceo of sony said that for the um spider-verse uh the next spider-verse movie they're going to be using ai to uh help make uh the movie a lot easier for their uh workers and their animators um, but what he didn't preface is the fact that we have always used AI and always will be using AI to make things such as a perfect circle, to make things just easier tools. They're yeah, not it's deal. streamlines. It's not necessarily the art. Yeah. And yeah. so basically what happened is because he said this thing and said it the wrong way, it got misconstrued and was used as a uh, tactic to start fear mongering for people and getting everything words get misconstrued all the time aaron lewis's uh heart was in the right place when he made that song Mm -hmm. but the words that he used were uh not well thought through and i think that there should have been maybe a little bit more i guess collaboration in figuring out how to get uh, his message across better because i think that that what he was saying is a very real real problem but he threw in the obese milking welfare in, uh, in there. People who are like they're not they're not the problem. Why we have uh, economic problems in the slightest? Yeah, yeah, Those are, for sure. Yeah, drops so in the bucket. That's that's Anthony's problem with that song, and he did go hard on the title of the song, um, but that's not what I personally had a problem with that song to begin with. Um, but anyways. I yeah. do think that Anthony just needs to I, I like what he's doing recently. He's actually getting other people to come in and to review albums of artists who 
these people are actually big fans of and actually know this band's history. It's like, oh, I know this artist's history, so I'm going to be the person that reviews it. I'm going to be the person that goes about it because I actually have grown up listening to them, so I understand the context behind the meanings of these songs. Mm -hmm. And Anthony thinks that I, – I, I agree with him that he's – this is a great way to get people to recommend to it. But what sucks is that because it's not Anthony's face, you know, it does poorly. Yeah. But yeah. hopefully, hopefully this changes in time. Cause maybe with something a little bit more popular over the time, you know, these people can have a, a, a time in the spotlight. Anthony definitely uh, does lack a lot of experience in certain areas, but that's why he's getting these new people to get into uh, where it is. So anyways, well, and you know, learning to critique stuff myself i mean you it's just not possible to have perspective on every facet yep of music you know what yep. i mean mm -hmm. um you know kind of leading into your own album dude and this is back to my comment about you being based as fuck i feel like above anybody else i've met while doing this i feel like you actively seek out criticism as like a way to uh strengthen your musical composition like you value like every bit of criticism in fact there was the i saw you post it on instagram but it was actually a comment from when i had reacted to your album something about they said like oh there's some hard bits but overall it's like some cookie cutter bullshit mm -hmm. which I didn't feel that way about the album, but like, does that shit wear on you? Or do you look at it as every opportunity to just be better? When you uh, I find it as an opportunity like to be that. better. If someone thinks that what I was doing was boring, I believe that they have context to something that I'm not aware of. There's something there that they saw that I am not seeing. And I, and if they are able or are capable of taking uh, their um, their emotional response to my music and are capable of putting it in words and comparing. Hey, here's here's a band who does what you do, but they do it better. I will be like, oh, okay. I I thank you. I I am a firm believer in taking L's and growing. Yeah, I'm a firm but is there believer. some that like? Because that one, I just saying like something's like boring or cookie cutter to me just isn't a very valid criticism you know like because it's it's why is it boring you know like help me understand why you think this way because for me and maybe he's lacking context but for me you know i think there's what helps lift you up a lot in my eyes is the fact that you're doing this all by yourself not only that you, but you did all of this yeah in really a short amount of time when you think about it when you started writing music or started to learning to play music mm. you've done what a lot of people can't do like that in and of itself dude i think you're miles ahead of a lot of people at this stage <laughs> you know what i mean uh i i i, I may be <clears throat> miles ahead but i think that there's still miles more for me to go oh yeah uh, absolutely so no i'm not Trust but me. I could tell you, I could tell you why I, I think I've like I just kind of thought about it. I think I know why he thought it was boring. It's because a lot of my songs are pretty much just it, it's a lot of just zeros and ones. It's it's binary metal, and it, but a, a lot of the the text and a lot of the flavor and a lot of the atmosphere doesn't come from the guitar. It comes mm -hmm. from the orchestra that I have. It comes from the effects that I put in there. That's where a lot of my context comes <sighs> into, and I can understand that someone would find that boring. And so if anything, who knows, maybe I can try and figure out a way to make it more extravagant and play in different areas of the neck. Finally, there's another little thing I wanted to talk about that I think is would be interesting. Sure. However, it's this one might be a little heavy and maybe a little close to home, but it's something that I, I think you have experience with and something that I'm genuinely interested in. But if it's too personal, just tell me to fuck off and we can move on. In our last fuck off, episode, move on. yeah, <laughs> fuck you. No, I'm at least asking. In our first interview together, you had mentioned that you were on the spectrum for autism. Clearly, I would say you're pretty high functioning. But have you found that to be a hindrance or an asset as far as your music writing goes? Lately, I found it to be both, 
because what it is is that I hyper fixate a lot on on my uh, music creation. Um, but then I'll get distracted and I'm, and I'll be like, man, I can't figure out where I need to go in this song. I hate this song. And then I move on and I do something else. I'll just play Elden Ring or just mess around on my phone or something like that. And, uh, lately I've just been in this area where I feel like, uh, a me by myself and writing my music by myself is kind of a, um, it is a detriment to, uh, my improvement. So, uh, I want, I'm, I'm going to be straight honest with you when it comes to my, uh, me being autistic, I think that it's just a non-factor. I think that me being autistic isn't really much of a factor because I believe that what I am capable of has nothing to do with whatever neurological thing is going on up here. Mm -hmm. If I want to do something, I don't want to let that stop me. Sometimes right. it will, but I want to find ways to get my passion back. I want to find ways to fall in love with the creation again. Um, I know I don't really know if I'm answering your question all that well, but no, I no, guess... no, that's a perfect answer because, like, to kind of clarify my position and the reason I ask is I was wondering if, like, this is if metal in general is like kind of a stem for you, that like the technicalities of it all, right? And then that made me wonder, like with how you focus on criticisms and your constant improvement to try and be better. It seems like you kind of hyper focus on certain aspects that I think, you know, really could benefit you, but I could also see like the, the distractions or like, you don't like the path a certain song is going down, like the further it goes along. So you just kind of scrap it. I think that happens to pretty much everybody. Yeah. You know what I mean? Is it starts with an idea, it's not going the way you want it, or you're not feeling the muse of it. You know what I yeah. mean? So you kind of just scrap it, but it's probably better to hang on to those because you never know. Like somewhere down the line, you know, end up becoming something when you revisit it. I actually you know? do implement <clears throat> a lot of old riffs and <clears throat> melodies that I have hung on to for years. Uh, and I found that to be kind of like cathartic. It's like, oh, this thing that I, didn't really like all, all those times ago is kind of came back and it works now. It's yeah. crazy. Me and you had discussed privately in messages that I found kind of interesting because I kind of resonated with this, but it differs from like what other artists, like when they release an album, it's finally out there. They felt like this sense of relief where for you, you felt like there was kind of like now this void because you weren't actively working towards something. This thing that become like your gem and like your art and everything that you wanted to pour yourself into is like, now it's like, it's, it's done. It's out there. It's like, fuck, what do I do next? So yeah. Walk yeah. me through that. And have you found the muse again to be creative? I, 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 I did actually. Um, I found a really First of all, um, I actually am going to be dropping three more songs later this year with Sun Scourge, of course. I don't know if you heard about that. I, I was going to ask about that, but continue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so I did find uh, I did find the will to um, to do that. <clears throat> However, I also found the uh, found a, 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 re reset, a sense of excitement in making music again, because um, going back on what I said, I by myself, I think that if I just write music all on my own, I think that, that that's going to hinder what I am capable of creating. And I think I should just cast my side, uh, my pride aside. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually going to be working with somebody um, and going to try and see if we can get something uh, to sound uh, as sonically um distinct from anything else that's out there right now and something different from what you guys have done previously like separately yeah that my that's my <clears throat> goal my goal is to to make something that's not necessarily like him and not necessarily like me but something that sounds like the both of us yeah something similar to what uh sinistia and disembodied tyrant kind of did but not like that yeah. sound necessarily but like the collision of two yeah. artists you, you know what's funny is 
I actually went through and I listened to uh, Disembodied Tyrant and Sinestia's uh, old stuff before they dropped their uh, their big EP. Mm-hmm. And uh, I realized that what they both brought to the table was Sinestia brought the most insane uh, symphonics known to man. And then Blake just straight up went like, oh, yeah, we'll check this out. And then just threw down the nastiest vocals and guitar playing known to man. Yeah, well, some of the vocals had to do with uh, uh, Vile from uh, Sinestia, too. Oh, shoot. I, I wish I actually was able to recognize that. That's my B. I'll no, no. Them. And you know what? I Because I had said the same thing during that podcast. So it was like they meshed together in such a way it was hard to differentiate between the mm. two. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, And they, they said that was by the design. Okay. You know what I mean? They really wanted to just be a cohesive thing that, you know, really just fit together and they layered each other to where it's, you know, think of Sinestia and Disembodied Tyrant as one band during that, as opposed to like trading off verses or choruses or. Got it. But, I like uh, that. I like yeah. that. And dude, I think scene fiend, that's a good connect to have. And I really enjoyed his shit with sun scourge. Uh, same as, Sinestia and Disembodied Tyra, I think you guys are going to fit together like jigsaw pieces with that and create something uh, exciting, dude. So looking forward to that. So when yeah. you guys it's have not, something, let it's me know. not necessarily going to be like that where we're, where I'm, where it's like that necessarily. It's like he wrote three songs and I wrote three separate songs. Uh, I did three songs all by myself and then I was on two songs and then did backup vocals for another one. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So it's kind of like a split, more of a traditional split EP with some exactly. collaborations in there. Exactly. Okay. okay. Um, are you guys going to be doing like the going through like the same like producers and kind of treating each? We already did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it all has like a similar sound. Yeah. We actually went through the same uh, producer that uh, we used or that I used for uh, Deceivers. Nice. Nice. That was, yeah, that was uh solid dude from a production standpoint he actually got uh, I, some new equipment that uh makes the masters insanely loud i love it really? yeah. oh yeah and what would that be he just said he got new equipment that makes the oh. masters really loud <laughs> oh i i thought you said you had gotten new equipment i was like well do share what's the producer's name tom cadden tom cadden what has he, he worked is... on besides your project uh he works on uh He's worked on Body Prison. Uh, there's another band called Hold on, Heaven something, Heaven's Gate, and uh, another. They're they're a very small band. You might not have heard them. They're called To the Grave. <laughs> okay, nice. Yeah the the uh, the, the production for uh, Ecoside. That's him. Oh okay, hell yeah, dude. Is he based out of Australia then, or? Yep. Uh, okay, cool. That'll be exciting. Uh, let me know when you guys have something to show. Love to. Uh, I, I, I actually, I actually do have stuff to show, but I'm just not going to show it to you yet. Yeah, you have to wait. Enough. You have to wait until it comes out this time. That's okay, dude. I understand. So now I think it's time we can dive into the album. So Whew. again, Deceivers, first full length by Oracle Specter. You really went to the depths of the human condition, do explore some dark places with this album uh tell me a little bit about that because some of these feel like they apply to you like some of the stories or at least you see yourself in some of these characters that you're talking about yeah and then others could be about other people but yeah so kind of just give me like a rough summary of like what you're going through when they're they are all coming from a very they're almost all of them are coming from a very personal place And they are all uh, something that people can see in uh, in others. Simple as that. I would love to just kind of be pretentious and give you this whole thing, but I think that's the best way to sum it up. No, that's perfect, dude. All right, so let's start off with track number one, The Shadow's Maw. Um, great opener to the album. This one's competing for my favorite song on the album. It's between two. Uh, you might be able to guess the other one. Gotcha. 
So let's go through the rough summary. Let's see the music, the lyrics, the theme. I just loved everything about this track. And you talk about people painting their traumas onto you. So walk us through that a little bit. What you mean with that? So something that I had I had been thinking about for a while is it started off with the idea that people, when they're born into the world, they are essentially a blank canvas. Mm-hmm. And as they grow older, they need to determine their uh, their destiny, their own path and their own way uh, of life. But the thing is, is that you aren't just a canvas. You are also the culmination of every thought you've ever acted on and every person you've ever met, anyone you've ever talked to, anyone that you've ever hung out with. And all these interactions that you have are actually affecting you on a very subconscious level and when you grow up as a child your parents are essentially painting themselves onto you to but they want to make another them because they're essentially having a child is having a second chance in life and that's one of the beautiful things about having a a, a kid as we get older these traumas that they they have are going to be inflicted upon us. They want to change you into uh, relating with their ideals and to their beliefs. And this goes as far as even the teachers that you uh, talk to, at all the friends that you make, and their parents being uh, being brushed off from the, onto their kids, and then those kids onto you. All these different interactions are just waves of interactions in chaos creating the person that is ultimately you and <clears throat> what it all comes down to is the sense of where you're losing your innocence as you go and you're changing yourself in order to fit in more and more and more to uh, be able to acclimate and to socially uh, become accepted to your peers because that is what all these traumas do. They make you want to become something that is acceptable. And by the end of the song, where it, it caps off with "Am I enough now?" is because you've done all this to me. You've you've took my innocence. You've taken everything that I've ever wanted to do. You have told me that everything I've ever said is stupid. Am I good enough now? Am I the type of person that you wanted to see? I mean, I can definitely relate to that song because. Um... My brother and I, uh, we've had a pretty troubled past with our parents. I would say we've done as best as we can to break that cycle. We could have ended up a lot worse, you know, given everything. Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy for you. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. Um, No, I'm proud of it because it's like, you know, I look back and a lot of people that would uh, crumble under, you know, some of the shit we've been through some of the shit I've seen. We just pushed on. And uh, I mean, I'm not without my my fucking mental issues. Trust me. All things considered, we turned out pretty well. And that's my hope for anybody. But another kind of interesting thing is, is like this also, this idea of people painting their traumas onto you. It happens with almost virtually any person you can come into contact with, whether that be like, you know, struggling to be part of, you know, friend groups or something or like doing something that like kind of goes against your nature as a person to impress certain people, you know, what have you. And what's by the end of it, it's like if you take what I really thought was interesting, uh, when you take a brush stroke, right, like we're imagining ourselves as a blank canvas and you take a brushstroke from like every person in passing right and it's all a different color let's imagine right so if everybody's adding just one brushstroke of color by the time like you fill the canvas with all these different colors it just leaves black canvas because like once you add like all the colors together it just becomes black it becomes brown i don't know shit about art so black, <laughs> it's okay black black is uh um... you just become shit basically yeah yeah <laughs> Exactly. So, no, that was uh, a, la- a lack of, of identity is, is there. And yeah. That's why it's, it, it makes sense because it's brown. Lack of identity, shit personality. Yeah, it is. Uh, this was one of the, um, I think, lyrically and thematically, one of my favorite tracks as well. And then I like how it wasn't really Thaw, but I felt like you threw in like some Thawly chords. You know, they were very like dark, ambient, dissonant 
uh chords it felt like like from the start of the song and then uh you go into like this really interesting like piano motif and i would say this throughout the album dude there's like these you pepper in these like little melodies really really well they're dark but they kind of bring you out of the darkness a little bit you know what I mean? Because they're like very melancholy. They can be, you know, sad or whatever, but it's like it goes from like anger to sadness and it's just kind of like all over the place emotionally. Yeah. So that's a breakdown of Shadow's Maw. Now let's get into The Valley of the Flies, the very first song we ever listened to. In this one, you tell the story about a man trying to save a woman from hell only to be trapped there and end up being taunted by a demon, conveying how a savior complex can lead us on a downward spiral. Have you had experience with this personally? Yes. Tell me about it. There was actually a girl who I met a long time ago, um, and she went to um, she went to the church that uh, I was going to at the time, and she was uh, really, really going through some serious stuff. I was like Captain Save-A-Ho, and so I'm like, oh man, I can I can Dude. fix her. Yeah. And so it, it was it wasn't like oh she's got mental problems. It was like serious 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 shit she was going through, mm -hmm. and life altering shit. And I was just trying my my everything to try to get her to stop doing that and stop acting like that because I'm like oh I know I know best I I can get you out of here. But there came a point we ended up stopped talking because she just didn't want to hear me try to protect her. And to be honest, to be honest, her cutting me off and her doing her own thing was probably one of the best things that she could have done for herself because you were enabling it. Maybe. Yeah, pretty, almost, almost, almost. Um, I don't even know if enabling is the right word because it was like. Or you made her feel secure, like within the destruction without like addressing it. Not even that. Not even that, man. It was just it was just pathetic attempt after pathetic attempt. Nothing but words and barely any action. Even when I and there was another time where it was another person where I'm like, hey, you should come to church and you should <laughs> da, da 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 da. And I tried doing that and I realized, you know, they just they just straight up just you need to understand that it came a point where it was just after all these accumulations of me trying to save them and, and and then like after the whole thing i needed to realize what my actual intentions were and i forgot what my intentions were my intentions on bringing them to church and trying to bring them to light were specifically selfish and <clears throat> they weren't about actually saving them and that's essentially a, a huge part in what valley of the flies is is that before you even dive into hell you need to make sure that you have your your intentions in in order and you need to make sure that you know wh why you want to save them and because if you're going to go down there and you're going to get yourself stuck in there because of some selfish reason you're going to be stuck there and that's where you're going to end up being because they're just going to drag you to hell and they're going to keep you there because when if you have no idea how to get out of hell like what the guy did in the story you're stuck there if if you and he have no idea how to navigate through whatever hell that they are in and no have no idea on like what they're going through and how to sympathize or relate to it in any way or any capacity you're gonna end up even further down deep in there than what you could have if even if you knew where everything was it's just like the, the whole premise of the song is you can't take from hell that which walked into it that's the whole idea behind it. So when you're writing these stories, how does it kind of start? Because like these could almost like come out as like, you know, fables or like short stories, if you would. Mm. So like, how does the idea in your head begin? How do you and how do you like or how do you apply yourself into like a story format? I guess it helps if you have a solid understanding of the abstract and symbolism and understanding mm -hmm. i watched a lot of like reviews of movies behind people who have worthwhile repertoire and i have seen a lot of how like what what a lot of meaning behind specific very surreal movies and stuff do, does i think a movie that really helped me understand and how to think of the lessons and stuff like that in a very very um abstract way is a, a movie called uh the holy mountain which came out in 1990s uh okay. the holy mountain the holy mountain um to give you what kind of like it is 
a very, 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 very weird movie. And just going in there and having no idea like what you're supposed to get from it and you just watch it as like a casual person, you're going to you're going to give in the, t- the typical WTF did I just watch? This is so weird. But you need to understand that there there is an, an there's a reason why all these people are taking these these naked people like although why they have these naked people painting their butts and having them sit down on these canvases over and over and over again. They have them doing that because it's supposed to represent to win art becomes nothing more than factory made interesting dude i'm gonna have to check out that movie Um, it it came out in the 1970s and it's so far ahead of its time dog what's it's called the holy mountain yes okay yeah i'll check it out you really paint a picture with your words in a way that like i don't know maybe maybe i'm biased maybe it helps because like i've read through your track breakdown so i know exactly what you're thinking with each with each song well the next track unfeathered is pretty straightforward i think anybody can understand where you're going with that that was an example of like at first i was like ah it's not really hitting with me as much i think valley of the flies and uh void sayer just left like a bigger impression so when that when this at first didn't quite hit the mark i was just like eh. but like the more i continued to listen to it over time i was like oh dude i dig this i love that bridge section and where the song goes from there really brought it up for me uh so you know how they're in a unfeathered before the before and after the first um chorus there's a but and then it goes that that is a sonic uh, symbolic representation of coming down and then getting high again. Oh, interesting, dude. That That is an artistic choice for sure. Dude, because, that makes and, me and, and, wonder. And, and here's the best part. Here's the best part. I really pride myself on this is because you take like it go. He he starts off high, right? In, in the song, he has his first hit. He comes down in the chorus. He's resenting himself calling himself god's abomination it's like god i wish i could stop i wish i could just be normal again gets high again and then the song is going on about how i don't need to i I can quit whenever i want i can leave whenever i want i don't care it's i'm my own man i got this and then and then it just goes right back to uh calling himself god's abomination again and then eventually gets so out of touch that he's just like i gotta get out of here and he can't now because now he's stuck in addiction and he has to crawl out and it has to be a very painful uh, way out now because you've gone in so deep with it. You've been in there so, for too long. Our parents were uh, meth addicts. So I've seen addiction firsthand and what it can do mm. to people. It's uh, mm. it really is a disease, man. It's fucking wild, dude. Like uh, what people go through and they, to become like fiends really like fiend is like the most accurate word dude because they turn into something else entirely um shout out to you and your brother you guys have made it yeah yeah with our fucking 1300 subscribers dude you want to know how much money i've made on youtube so far the entire dollars? career close 35 ah yeah <laughs> I, I was close i was close <laughs> fucking made it man no you know what dude like money's not really a fucking big deal to me dude i'm i'm more so like not to like get too off topic it's just like i love talking about metal i love talking about like the philosophy of metal and it was like i just wanted to be feel like a part of something you know whether it's like giving my opinion whether people value that or not so that's kind of just where this whole started i feel like this song is this about are are you putting yourself in this song? Is this song about you, Unfeathered? Yeah, or is I, this about I have, I've 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 struggled with uh my own addiction as well. I'd rather not say, but I do struggle with my own addictions and my own vices. For me personally to break out of it is something that I have to overcome on my own. Um I'm I'm very, very fortunate that I have a a wonderful living con- condition to where I can be able to escape that safely and properly. Yeah, absolutely, dude. I know what rock bottom looks like, dude, and it's it's tough to get out of. So when you have like a good uh, support system, whatever that may be, that can help you out, dude. Mm-hmm. Um, um, you got to be thankful for that. Moving on to Glass Archer. This song was different. It was very unique It was from like the rest of the album. This feels more traditional like just symphonic metal 
Like, obviously, you had the a disgusting breakdown at the end of it, but very, I don't want to say safe, but um, that's the radio song. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one you had an issue with. So why did it make the album then? When Tom mixed and mastered it, I liked it again. Mm. And now I was like, you know what? This ain't that bad. This really ain't that bad. It is actually my third most popular song on uh, on Apple Music slash iTunes right now. Before we get into the other songs, what is your favorite song you think off the entire album? For a while, it was uh, The Shadows of Ma, but I think now I've kind of changed it to... Um, uh harvesting death's embrace okay specif- specifically for the fact that that is closer towards the direction that i want to kind of go i want to kind of have something that's haunting but not so melodic and so safe i want something that's going to really stick with someone and really affect them and i and i think that that's that song really has a lot more staying power in its uh, composition than in uh, most. And plus, uh, the themes behind it, um, I think, are something that I get behind a lot more than not, not not a lot more. I think just a touch more than the rest. OK, yeah, we'll we'll get more into that song as it's coming up. Before we move on to rain, I, I want to tell you something interesting about Glass Archer now. Yeah, absolutely. I had a co-worker. He was a very transparent piece of shit. <laughs> OK, he was basically like he spoke and acted like a like a like a I don't know, theta iota theta fucking frat boy, dude. And and yeah, yeah, he he had ego maniac. Fucking. Yeah, he had he had like this. He was like this five foot nine bearded, uh, bearded guy who like he was he was always trying to hit on all the uh, all like the other like cashier girls that were out there. He was who would try and like I, I'm not even joking when I say this. He would essentially act like Drake. Like he, oh, he would God. go around. Yeah, he would go around. He, he would go up to like some of the girls that were in the cashier. It's like, hey, what's up, bestie? Why haven't you given me your Instagram? <laughs> like that, right? Mm-hmm. And then I ended up finding out through uh, one of my other coworkers that I was um, that I was friends with. I ended up finding out that what he would do is that he would actually leave the deli area from the grocery store he worked in. He would leave the deli area. He would walk around the store and he would ogle women who he thought had fat ass or fat tits and he's like hey i just saw this mama with a big bub go be right back and he was so transparent about with that kid because uh he was like a 20 he was 20 year old not not the guy the guy was like he was my age he was 27 28 and the other guy uh he was telling to was like this 20 year old 21 year old and he's and he never he barely ever snitches but he told me this because i hated him i really did because he would barely get any work done and he would suck at whatever job he would do and we actually caught him eating food uh, that he hadn't paid for and it just continued to pile up and get worse and worse for this guy and the craziest thing is that the only reason why this dude got fired is because somebody else that we were working with swung on him and so when that person got fired, the so the person that was there that witnessed the fight, he said, hey, uh, just want to let you know, the guy who got uh, swung on, he's an instigator. He's, he started the whole thing. Uh, he's done this, 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 this. He was fired. Just had a whole paper trail. Exact trail. same day. Yeah, yeah. Exact same day. They were both gone. We lost yeah. two people, but honestly, I don't Fuck care. Him exactly dude, I, that's so, surprising he didn't get fired for fucking eating shit he didn't pay for dude because i one of my first jobs was i worked for i forget yeah. what they're they are in california but in uh colorado at the time they're called safeway which is like ralph's or I, some I, shit. safeway but, safeway i work with them too okay um i was a grocery manager for safeway dude if you got dude like we had a dude that um this is totally off topic but it's okay he had worked there for like he had made a career working the produce department, dude. He was like an assistant manager of the department. Been there for like 40 years, dude. Had like a fat pension built up, all this shit. This dude got fucking fired first time, dude, for 
just taking a bag of gummy bears. That whole fucking forty year pension just gone, dude. Dude was fucked. Like, See, here's here's the thing. It's the problem isn't that like oh we knew it was him, but because we didn't catch him in the act, that's mm. why we couldn't do it. We knew like oh all of a sudden these empty cups of 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 just pasta are in the cooler. All of a sudden these bones of like already eaten uh bone in chicken wings are hidden behind these boxes whenever he's he's working we knew it was him but we just couldn't catch him in the act because he uh, was hiding he was hiding away from cameras so we couldn't catch him there he was hiding away from other people so we couldn't catch him and it was it, it sucked so glass archer back on topic Glass Archer, the song is a basically a metaphor for a person who tries to hold themselves up for a very high status, try to make themselves like seem like a good person. They want to make themselves perceived as someone that is worth admiring, worth praising. More important but, than they are. But the moment that you take them out of the spotlight and you look at them in an actually dark place, similar to the glass, uh, the glass horse, you realize just how ugly of a person they really are on the inside. You can see right through them, see all the grotesque gore that just makes up their existence. And the um, they have a scorpion's tail, as I've... Yeah, because this is based on the constellation, the archer. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And so this scorpion's tail is similar to how scorpions can't escape their tail as a liar can't escape their delusions this guy was a habitual liar and he could not stop himself there was one time where he was gone for like almost an hour he came back me and my co-worker said yo where were you you were gone for like an hour and he said oh i was out stalking the shelves and we both laughed at him and called him a liar right in front of a customer and the guy he then went man you guys are stupid you guys are dumb i'm not lying yeah. So, yeah. Dude, well, even like beyond that, man, it's like we can talk about this like regarding because I feel like this album and kind of that song in particular, but <laughs> this album really feels like some narcissistic people or bad faith people just kind of fucking did you dirty, dude. Oh, but, yeah. Some um, deceivers definitely did do me dirty. So a good example of this, I'm like somebody that has a very difficult time separating the art from the artist. Like if you're a piece of shit, I just it like just ruins the whole experience of listening to your music for me. And it's like, Cruddy, Reggie. dude, you read my fucking mind. Holy shit. But, um, you know, what was funny about that is because like I, ref I refuse to react to any of his music. Like I, I was thinking about doing it to like just meme. Taste just a fucking meme on it you know what i mean which it'd probably get copyright striked i might have to try that sometime but um i watched like a part of uh that's it's more so i just keep seeing fucking clips of mm -hmm. that stupid like country fusion oh it's fight so with jelly, bad jelly roll song dude you know what's funny about that song the most dude he's like now all of a sudden he wants to like backpedal on everything and be like see guys i'm not a transphobe i have like the token conservative trans girl fucking Blair White that like everybody uses to say like I'm totally not a transphobe miss pull the fucking ladder up behind me Blair White who fucking hates on oh other you trans mean people. like the same people who say I'm not racist my friend is black yeah exactly it's and then that they, same mindset no did, just because yeah. you know or hang out with someone like that doesn't mean you don't have these problems like here it's like oh it's all oh, dude there's nothing worse that you can do than to use someone as a token i was like look i'm not it's great example when uh uh uh, uh jerry jerry seinfeld or whatever when um uh that one guy who kramer was Kramer, yes, yeah. when he what he went on and he was going to do some comedy, and then he had a black opener. He's like, "Look, I'm not racist. I got me a black opener. I'm not yeah. racist, bro. You can't be this dumb. You can't think we're this dumb. No, I don't. I don't. I don't believe that that's the case. If you want, if you want to prove 
that you are genuinely not like if you're not transphobic express something positive like i don't know tr- trans rights simple as yeah. that these are real people they don't they they deal with the same problems we do if not more if not worse and you're right. gonna go and create more problems for them fuck yeah. you and the horse you rode in on well especially because he has such a big fucking platform which i still don't understand for the life of me why people because the music's genuinely not that great dude it's nothing like genre defining or groundbreaking about falling in reverse first off like you can like the music that's fine and even as far as like whatever the fuck ronnie radke's opinions are that's fine dude just don't be a fucking little bitch and then just like act like it's like have some goddamn conviction or whatever listen I, I support trans rights, dude, but it's okay to have these fucking conversations, dude, as contentious as they may be, because they affect everybody, not just trans people. But regardless, yep. it's like, don't be a fucking douche about it. Or like, if you are going to be a douche about it, that's cool. Just don't fucking try to backpedal and be like, see, guys, I'm not the transphobe you fucking paid me to be. It's like, yeah, you are, dude. Like, Just own it. Just fucking own it, dude. Like, nobody gives a like. You're still like wildly successful. Like, what are you even like trying to appeal to at this point? I don't know. And then it's like, yes, it's terrible. It's terrible. And he's just getting worse. It's getting worse, dude. Man, uh, something that, that's crazy that you need to understand is him going country isn't even a new thing. He yeah. did in 2013 on the album <laughs> fashionably late that was the last track it was i didn't a, know that it was the last track was country inspired you could hear him and what's crazy about it is that that song despite it being the worst sounding is the most genuine out of all of them Bro, the lyrics on almost every single song except for that one were some of the worst shit that I've ever heard. That is the same album where my life is like a video game came from. All these insane things that he's doing now, he has already done. So people say, oh, this is groundbreaking. This is amazing. No. No, he's it's done not. It before and he's done it worse. <laughs> but I... I mean, I don't know if like country and metal is like the best thing to really like try to fuse together. Can't Maybe in it. some, I think, I think if, I could probably I'm kidding, I'm kidding, think of a way, I could probably think of a way if like bands took it seriously, but this felt like more of a meme, like the song in and of itself, dude. It just felt He's like a joke. Big. Yeah, exactly. And I don't even like necessarily like hate falling in reverse it's just like more so the way he portrays himself like he's always this superhero or this fucking larger than life figure literally in his music videos the just the narcissism to me is just a huge major turn off dude to where i'm just like nah i'm good dude to go back to your glass archer that probably perfectly encapsulates something i'm talking about dude it's just like it's just kind of people like that just i want nothing to do with them so yeah. anyways uh yeah they're pieces of shit start calling out your local narcissist fuck those people you see yes, red flags and then isolate away. them in their own room where they can't touch and talk to anybody exactly based all right moving on rain so this according to your breakdown kind of started out as more of a meme but uh transformed into something meaningful isn't that fucking wild dude how you start with an idea of something whether or not like something traumatic happens or you know some kind of outside force comes into it what starts as like your idea for something it like almost takes on a life of its own and like become something entirely different walk us through rain and what it means to you because it's just a simple interlude really but yeah so um rain is essentially that is my dad's favorite song on the entire album because that is a song that i attached to my grandfather the the loss that the whole family had gone through what it, it, like initially like was this I pretty was, recent 
Do you mind? Yeah. That? Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that, man. It's okay. It's okay. I appreciate the condolences. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, is that uh, I initially just wanted to do a funny little meme and just kind of like post it on uh, the discord for Brad Tasty Music or whatever. Mm -hmm. But then what ended up happening is, you know, the whole incident with my grandfather happened and he passed away. The song became into something where it was kind of talking about how, how um, depression is essentially a opportunity for growth growth because the rain symbolizes sadness and how it's going to rain and no matter what you're going to do you're going to experience loss because we all do and be prepared for that because once once the rain lets up you'll find yourself ha has has grown because we are like trees now when you started writing this track was it originally kind of tied to your relationship or the connection you had with your grandfather how did it morph into that how did you tie it to that it was it was literally like literally what happened was is I was just it was just something that I was just messing around and then it was all that was happening and it happened for such a long time that I hadn't worked on my music in <sighs> close to a month and that was a long time considering how often I do work on my music um, I. I've been in a much longer dry spell as of recently, but mm -hmm. at that time I was always working on my music every day, always trying to perfect what I was doing. But what ended up happening is that when I went back and I saw that my project for uh, the Yoko Ono uh, cover was up, <laughs> I was like, I was sorry, like, oh, I didn't mean to laugh, dude. This is a no, weird inspiration it, to take it is. from, dude. It's a very weird inspiration because it it wasn't supposed to be for that. I just saw it. I just, it, it clicked. My brain just broke. And I was just like, you know. Maybe this bitch was on to something. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. So now there are two dead people that are attached to this bitch. <laughs> Wait, is Yoko dead? Did Yoko no, die? no, Yoko's still alive. Just John it's, uh, Lennon. She, yeah, John Lennon and my grandfather. She didn't kill him. It's just like he'd probably be dead of natural causes about this point, anyways. I don't know. Who knows? Fair, fair. I mean, Paul McCartney's still. I'm alive. not too sad about it, dude. I'm over it. It's uh, fine. Yeah, we still have Paul. Anyways, so then now we're leading into uh, track number six, "Harvesting Death's Embrace," um, and this is talking about the exploitation of death for profit. So naturally it works like coming from uh the interlude of rain into the song like thematically but it was that also kind of tied to like an experience with your grandfather yeah he was already going through cancer at that time when i was writing that song i wish there was a way to just opt to like fucking throw my body to the wolves when i'm going because it's like dude who wants to like put your family potentially in like some debt over you know they're already suffering enough you know what i mean i i can't imagine looking someone dead in the face and being like so sorry for your loss will that be cash or credit honestly it was when my great grandma and my great grandfather both died they had a full on like big catholic ceremonies this giant just like like big thing where we walked through this this hall of of literal like cadavers that were like the all the walls were full of just dead people in there and what they did is that they had this one slot that went super super deep it was like i'm gonna say close to 24 feet deep 20 it was a wall that was 24 feet long and in it was my great grandfather and then afterwards they put no no in it was my great grandmother and then when my great grandfather pa uh, that passed away they put him in the same uh part of the wall that my great grandmother had passed away in the fact that it literally costs everything of the people who are alive is where I am just I'm disgusted with yeah. because there are vultures who look to find every reason that they can be like, oh, you're sad, man. You know, I'm sorry for your loss, but you know what? I think we should give your fill in the blank someone uh, at a ceremony celebrating their life. Don't you think they were a great person? I wish there was a way to opt to just like the person dies, you do the autopsy, whatever 
whatever. And then you just release the body to the family and they do with it, you know, like maybe have guidelines set up, like you have to dispose of it in this way, but like not, you know, charge people a fucking arm and a leg to just properly put their family member to rest i think that's even cremation that was expensive oh yeah dude and that's like what to like run the fucking oven for like 10 minutes or whatever dude to scoop out the ashes that's the way i'd like to go personally because it's like i'm looking for the cheapest option possible for my family yeah. getting more into the music side uh the breakdown was fucking disgusting on this track definitely gave me some stank face uh but not as much as these lines that you put in which I'm sure you know what they are. I'm going to read them. Death is a whore in your street. Fuck the hole six feet deeper. My God, dude. What the fuck is wrong with you? Now that <laughs> you gave no fucks, dude. That shit hits like a Mack truck. Little edgy, but I dig it. I don't know if you can elaborate more on that. Like, no, go for it. Go for it. Ask um, me away. There's like really a disdained and like aggressiveness pit toward these people. I feel like more so the the song about the addict or the song about the glass archer. Like these are these are all like archetypes. I feel like of the human condition of how fucking deranged people can become. Right. This one specifically is there's so much vitriol in these lyrics, dude. Like towards these people, you're like, man. Fuck you. I can tell you the biggest reason why that's the case is because, um, honestly, man, most of these songs have an iota of pity towards them. This one, I have no pity for you. You are a predator. You are a piece of shit. You are a scum. You got shit more twisted than a fucking tornado. I go fuck yourself. I cannot wait for you to leave everything that you have stolen when you die. Yeah, fuck those people, dude. This one, I don't know. This is another one. Like the first time I heard it, I wasn't sure how to feel about it. But the more I listened to it, I was like, oh, Oh, this is fucking filthy, dude. My God. We are going to get into, this is the second favorite track that's competing for first for me. Sun Messiah. Uh, you already know how I feel about this one. I didn't resonate so much with the, the lyrics as this one. I think the story itself is interesting. It's just not something I really could see myself in, I guess, because it's talking more about like religion, I guess, which mm. we can get into that. That's an interesting uh, thing I wanted to talk about too. For sure. But um. This song I had already told you I felt like should have been the closer to the album. Either way works, right? The, going from this to Void Sayer works perfectly fine. Just like this song hit in such a different way, like melodically, it just felt so unique to the rest of the album. And you had even told me that basically everybody was telling you that this should have been closing track. So maybe kind of go through your song process, walk us through what the song is about. And it sounds like you're a pretty religious person. And I kind of want to touch on that a little bit. I wouldn't sure. say like Bible thumper, but mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm I'm I don't think that religion I'm not a religious person. I think I am more spiritual. Um, okay. I'm I'm a spiritual person. Um I think that the religion can pertain to not just Christianity, but it can pertain to uh, to I Islam, to Muslim, to Bud Buddhism, to Hindu, uh, to paganism, the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. uh, because where you have a, a guy crashes down in into the ocean, the ocean is as life. It's the life. It's cold. It's uncaring. It's meant to drown and suffocate you. And we are all trying to swim in this giant ocean that we all exist in. And some people have learned how to swim in it and they have grown gills. They've grown fins on their hands and feet and they have figured out how to traverse through life. And some people have learned how to walk on life, to, to exist on top of it. And the Sun Messiah is one of those people. And what he does is that he then goes and says, hey, I want to show you this ability, this blessing that I have been given from the sun itself and this warmth, this this happiness. I want to share that with you. And that pertains a lot to how it feels when you first become it, not just indoctrinated, but become a, a believer. You're part of a community where everyone loves and cares about you. You're part of something that's uh, so much bigger than what you initially thought. 
And you then are called to this action where you are, they say, hey, spread God's word, spread Allah's word, or just make everyone more aware he's real, he exists. Take And so he takes the person's hand and he bestows the power of the sun upon this person who originally was drowning in the ocean. He said, go ahead, find more people that you can save. And so what the guy does is he then dives back into the water and he finds someone who has gills, who has fins, and he tries to save him and to pull him out of the water the same way that he was pulled out of. But what happens is that the other guy then ends up resisting. He doesn't want to because he's fine. He doesn't need it. Uh, and what happens is then the guy ends up soldering off this person's hand clean off, meaning now this person has a in a bad experience with this this person, this religion, and they're not going to want anything to do with it anymore because they are have a really bad experience with it because someone was trying to love somebody. They were trying to care for somebody, but they did it so wrong. They decided, no, I'm not supposed to find someone that's drowning. I'm just going to find someone that's underwater. I'm going to find someone that's just, just anybody. He didn't understand that his position, he was drowning. The other person wasn't drowning. They're fine. They can live inside the water. They don't need to be saved. And so because of that, um, he ends up going to uh, the Sun Messiah and says, hey, I messed up. Um, this person, the hand is gone. I soldered it off. And the person says, don't even worry about it. They're an enemy of the Sun. They're the Sun's enemy. They are someone that we that is against us and we are against so you need to fight against these people and continue doing what is according to the order of the sun because these are the the enemies and at that point there are two two ways that people can go they can become um, they can agree to it or they can disagree to it yeah, and in I this see. instance yeah, and in this instance, he disagrees with the Sun Messiah's teaching, and he says, I don't think we should be doing this. I want to save people, and I want to protect them in the way that I was protected, but I don't want to do it according to the Sun. I don't want there to be enemies. I want there to simply be harmony. And so what he then does is he then uh, secedes away from the Sun Messiah and continues to walk on the earth or walk on the, the water on his, and create his own path and says, if you want to create path by blood, that's up to you, but I'm going to carve my own. And that's what happens by the end of the song. If you find that the teachings of the church or whatever community that you are a part of completely is just against what you believe that it should be uh, and that it is against how people should deserve to be treated, then it is okay for you to secede away from that church. It's okay for you to follow the teachings of the word and not the teachings of the church or whatever it may be. It is gotcha. completely up to you and it is up to your religion with whatever God that you are praying to. Yeah. I grew up Christian. My mother was Christian. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not very religious or even really spiritual much anymore. You know, taking at face value, if we take like most teachings, you know, they just teach you to be a better person. And I think there's a lot of value in that for a lot of people. The problem, and I've seen this firsthand with a lot of, well, I shouldn't say a lot of, but some of the religious communities my family was a part of growing up. Um, and this is true with like literally any group of people, but you're going to have you know, just bad faith actors that kind of get in there, twist and contort it, unfortunately. And it's always been weird because like, I, I feel like especially in metal, there's so many like people that seem to have like this giant chip on their shoulder talking about Christianity or Catholicism or whatever. I think you need to like take a step back and just realize that everything that like has happened to you, this is exactly what they tell you not to do. I don't think that's Christianity's fault. This is like a consistent problem we have with just corrupt people that happen to get in these positions of power. You know what I, I mean? Yeah, the uh, the biggest, I think actually there's going to be um, <laughs> to kind of tease a little bit. Uh, my next album is is going to uh, have another song that's going to delve in a little bit more into uh, these types of people within religion. Um, but a lot of it just simply has to do with the fact that these are uh, simply just uh, people who worship without practice or, or sacrifice. They can go, they'll do 
all, all these other things or like be a part of the community and be say they're a Christian and do all these things and can quote Bible verses left and right. But they do not follow the teachings and they don't see any nuance within what is there. They don't mm-hmm. see the nuance in what is in how we are evolving forward as a community and as a human species versus to how the, the words were written. Because you look in the Old Testament, they're mentioning slavery and they're mentioning things that are outdated nowadays and do not mm-hmm. exist anymore within a, a more a contemporary Western society, societies. And so a lot of people say, oh, it's not slavery. They're talking about working, work, you're working people. So th- now there's nuance when it's convenient to make you not look bad. It, right. You know, something that I do want to kind of preface is that there is definitely a lot of people who have a lot of chips on their shoulders because of uh, how a lot of people they perceive uh, Christianity as a means for them to redeem themselves from what kind of person that they used to be. And it's just a long process for them to find that redemption in uh, in God rather than saying like, hey, God gave me the map to redeem myself and I simply need to follow it. But instead they're like, I just need to pray hard enough. Well, and I think like even people that... Uh... You know, it starts from like a good place of just wanting to morally or improve or just improve as a person. But exactly what 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 ends up happening, because like obviously the world's not, you know, chocked full of narcissists. Like, you know, it's not like a 50 50 shot like you're going to run into a narcissist. I'd say it's very few and far between. I think people, they they get elevated to just like a certain amount of status or whatever and then, you know, they become judgmental. It's like, you all got to remember, like, none of us are perfect, man. It comes back to that. You can't throw stones in glass houses. Like, and it really just needs to come back to a fundamental of like, we're all just here to be better people. You know, nothing more than that. Like, you know, no one's perfect. We all have our fucking issues. Uh, I remember when my parents were like potentially going to be overseers for like a particular church or whatever, and they got denied because my mom, her occupation at the time was as a bartender. I don't, I, I can't wrap my head around like that style of thinking. You know what I mean? It's like, it is what it is. Um, I've seen way worse yeah. things in churches, but that I'm not going to get into. But um, yeah, I think, I think what's fascinating about that is you'd think that the church would be uh, uh, excited for, hey, you're a bartender. You are literally, uh, you work at a place where some of the most, like the people who are drowning the most and need the most help and need guidance are. Do yeah. You want to be an overseer? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 I think it's just like a whole, oh, you work with alcohol. It's like, dude. Well, you- and that's a really interesting point because wouldn't you want like people of this, I don't want to say status, but like these, let's say people of this uh, unwavering belief, right? Wouldn't you want them in like those dark corners to like, you know, potentially help people? Yeah, exactly. Something you understand is darkness can exist without light. But the thing you also need to understand is that light existing without darkness is it's it's just blinding. They're both the Mm. same. They're the same thing because darkness without light is blinding and light without darkness is also blinding. You need to have shadows. That's where it needs to be. So if you can cast quite a if you yeah, if you can cast a light in some dark, some dark areas, then you have shadows and you have a place where mm. people can learn to uh, accompany these shadows within their own life. My first EP is called Embrace the Shadow, literally. So you got to understand that when people go to these dark areas, it's because they're trying to get away from the light. And so you, as someone that is can be a light can bring it closer to them it's like hey yo i heard that you just uh you lost your job you're 
uh, your your wife just settled in for a, a, a divorce for you. I'm sorry you're going through all this. It sounds like you really need some uh, you need some uh, some company and some communion. I actually have a, a church that would like to uh, come in and to accept you and wanted to know if you were uh, open to just spending some time with us. You don't have to go to church. We'll do, we have this time where we all just gather together. We eat food and we just talk and have a good time. We have a little bit of a Bible study. And if you want to zone out on that, that's okay. But just yeah. want you to just spend time with us. It's, it's, it's Even some- as simple as, you know, just going out of your way to like understand someone, you know, what they're going through and be like, you know what, I'm genuinely going to pray for you. That's me letting you know that I'm going to be thinking about you and I'm going to be hoping for the best for you. Mm-hmm. And I think that goes a long way. Um, again, not a very religious person myself, but I can see the benefit of it. For sure, um, for sure. I, and but you, in a lot of your storytelling, there's a lot of symbolism and themes of like angels, demons, and heaven from, you know, Valley of the Flies, Unfeathered. Unfeathered kind of feels like that fall from grace. So there's some uh, angelic themes, if you will, all the way back to Reaper of Dreams. You know what I mean? So that's why I kind of felt like there was this, uh, you leaned a lot on your religion, whatever that may be, to kind of tell these stories. I think something fun, uh, funny that, uh, bring, speaking of Reaper of Dreams, um, the, uh, I was struggling with the lyrics for Unfeathered for a while because uh, the lyric, um, a poison crow unfeathered by bliss. I'm like, man, why why am I going back to crows? That's so like tacky. I'm going back and using a similar thing. But then I think, wait a minute. No, because a crow is supposed to symbolize a fallen angel. And when a fallen angel is then become poisoned and they lose their wings, that's even worse. And I'm thinking, yeah. wait a minute. No, this actually works. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the whole thing works. To talk about the song itself a little bit, just more musically, uh, Mm -hmm. I absolutely adore the guitar progressions and melody you had with this song. And I hope that we get more moments of that from what you do in the future is such a standout song and a a standout premise, dude, uh, now that you've helped me understand it more. Sun Messiah, right? Yeah, yeah. Something I've always found like super fascinating too. Have you ever, there's a show on Netflix called Midnight Mass on Netflix. I've Um, never heard of it. I recommend you watch it. You might get some inspiration from it. I think you would enjoy it personally. The The premise of the show is basically this pastor gets, um, contracts like a, like vampirism becomes a vampire and the vampire that does this is you know a more traditional style vampire with wings and everything but in this world vampires and angels are one and the same so these vampires are actually like to be bitten by this vampire is like to be touched by god basically and something i found like really uh always interesting is this idea of um there's actually like a section in the bible that says it i can't remember the direct quote but it's like something about like we can describe an angel to you because it'd be like horrifying right so i've always been like fascinated by this idea of like almost lovecraftian idea of like an angel like from like another dimension that's just like monstrous that almost like drives you insane just to even like bear witness to it um but yeah i would check out that uh mid it's called midnight mass on netflix that's completely off topic a little bit but i always just uh thought that would be like a fun uh horror idea to explore the horror of angels, uh, almost like a but was it born of Osiris, a alien or angel, like that kind of premise. Yeah, yeah, angels yeah. or alien. Now, finally, we can move on to the last song. Thanks for bearing with me, dude, and pouring your heart out with all this, man. I really appreciate. Thank you for it. having me on here and let me do that, dude. I I think you have interesting story to tell um, through all these songs. Let's see, Void Sayer. This is one that probably should have resonated with the most. Similar to Glass Archer, you kind of allude to... No, I'm sorry. I'll just read the whole thing. The Void Sayer is all about fakes. Instead of it being about looking good, it's about being inspired and caring to gain something in return. They prey upon people in need of help, 
by feeding them the sweetest little quotes that do about as much as a screen door on a submarine. I originally compared this attitude to Melanie Martinez. Who the fuck is Melanie Martinez? Am giant, giant super pop star. Okay. No idea. See, see man, the, I'm probably the, the, better the, off. Yeah, no, like <laughs> she literally had like to, to stop for a moment. Uh, she literally had like two albums that were essentially taking like this perspective of like, Oh, I'm a, I'm a little girl going through all these, these traumas and I'm just, I'm perceiving trauma. I'm so out of touch with like pop star shit. Yeah, no, like (sighs) seriously, it's, it's the worst. And she would like, there's this one song where it literally is like taking like the perspective of a little girl who is my big brother's gonna, gonna touch me. He's and mommy, daddy are doing the no, no dance with, with the uh, funny, the funny flower in, in the bedroom. Oh, God. And it's yeah, like that's she, terrible. She 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 really tried to like mm. be this edge lord, and then afterwards, uh, her most recent album, it's an album that's all about positivity and being yourself. Don't let mad don't don't waste time being mad. It's like, dude, you literally have essay allegations on your hand, and you. F- you 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 sent all your fan your fans to go and harass the person that calls you out for it. So no, she's a terrible person. She was like, the other "Fuck person, you, got mine." Yeah. Now we can talk about and, the good shit. Yeah, and then the other person, which I'm sure I I talk about on the notes, is Darman. Do you know who that is? No. Yeah, you don't. I don't think you mentioned it here. I'll read so the Darman, rest real quick. It just says, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." Go for I it. originally compared this attitude to Melanie Martinez. But I think it was more like dozens of YouTube channels that make videos like racist Karen attacks young black boy. What That's happens Darman. next will shock you. That's Darman. Um, okay. It's not about teaching anything real. It's about getting your attention and in the long run, your money. So, yeah, explain to me this guy that you mean you're talking about. I mean, that title, it's clickbait as fuck, but I'll get into uh, yeah. No, my that's ex- on this. no, that's literally what uh, Dar Man does. He uh, literally uh, has an entire slogan where he's like, "We're not just telling stories; we're saving lives." Oh uh-huh. God! Yeah, and he literally ended up getting in trouble for not paying his actors and his crew members like barely anything like absolutely penny pinching in order for him to save money and to be able to to spend money on whatever that he wants and it's like bro these people are trying to eat these people are trying to live and you're just only worried about your own survival you gotta be kidding me you fat cat and i think honestly a different uh coin to kind of bring that on there it's not even just like that it's like the andrew tate's you know, like all yeah, the, different, like, yeah. like, like the, the people who are like, this is a type of person you got to be. The whatever gotta, podcast. Yes. Uh. The, the Adam 22s where they're on the Joe Rogans, where they're trying to be these uh, positive beacons of, of, of intelligence. Yes. They're trying to, oh, you got to improve yourself. Dog. All the stuff that they're telling you on how you need to improve yourself is some of the most backwards, flat earth type bullshit. Like he's out here trying to (laughs) tell us like, oh, bro, like uh, DMT. You ever done DMT before? It's like, bro, you want to talk about hallucinogenics? Why don't you take some ayahuasca? Like you need to change your whole like personality, dog, because you you need to like realize just how disconnected from intelligence you truly are yeah you you can be aware that you're dumb but you're not aware enough to know when someone else is dumb you gotta understand that i grew up between colorado and southern california so two places that are very liberal uh with their drug use right and i'm pretty liberal with it as well i don't partake but I see the benefit of things like marijuana, obviously, and even like, you know, psilocybin and mushrooms. That doesn't mean I want like DMT readily available for people. Cause like the fact is like some people just shouldn't have their hands on shit like that whatsoever. Dude. People with addictive personalities, people who, yep. who have 
you know, they have known substance abuse histories. I know for a fact that one of the biggest reasons why I don't drink is because I have an addictive personality. I know that the moment I start sipping on that sauce, I'm going to be lost. The thing that's stupid about the red pill shit is on its face, like just oh, we're just trying to improve the lives of men. Like, that's all great. It's like, I, dude, I don't know how to feel about it because some of it is like, so it should be like common sense, right? Like some of the shit that they're saying. I can tell you you the biggest reason why uh, it's biggest problem. It's promoting competition within people that have no interest in, in their lives oh you're genetically like this you're just like this so you gotta act like this working out is great eating healthy is great but these are all basic things keeping a sharp eye on your finances is great but the problem is is that you're going around and saying like oh the beta alpha and all this stuff yeah yeah it's morphed into something else you know you know what i ended up finding out did you know that the alpha and beta and the sigma whole omega shit that doesn't partake to wolves it never did it pertained to roosters it pertained to chickens so literally people are comparing themselves to cocks that's insane not any of that, but stupid fucking animals to begin with. The um, stupidest. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I love chickens, but uh, I ain't going to stop me from eating one. But, yeah, uh, me too. Dude, yeah, it is hard to look at this shit like your example of like the racist Karen attacks young, young black boy fucking clickbait, dude. Like, it's hard to see this shit, dude. Like the just like drama farm shit, right? And not just feel like black pilled. Or like somewhat like nihilist on shit, dude. It's like, fuck me. Just I hope fucking Seth Roth just like uses the black materia to fucking destroy the fucking Bro, right now, dude. Like, what a pull. Seth Roth, let's go. You like yeah. the game? Yeah, it's all right. I think you would FF7 was the first RPG I ever played back in the day. Nice. So that's like I have a lot of uh nostalgia for that suit that uh game in particular so you may or may not like it i i probably enjoy it because it's like very nostalgic for me I, but I if you're not thing, into it i used to have a thing for uh rpgs back when i was working as a telemarketer because it was easy for me to play video games and talk to customers customers at the same time but now i'm i'm like nah i can I, I I prefer playing fighting games, but now I don't even play fighting games anymore. I just play Elden Ring. My wife and I have been playing that. Oh, dude. Is, I'm a Elden huge Ring, Dark Souls geek, bro. Dude, dude, Elden Ring might be a solid like top five game of all time. I, oh, yeah. like, I it's a masterpiece. Like I, I would legitimately put that up there with like Mario 64 in terms of like groundbreaking video games. It's going to be a hard one for Miyazaki to top. And the fact he said, I ain't even dropped peak yet. <laughs> what? Dude, everything that man drops is fucking peak. Would it? Go, drop, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Dar- Dark Souls 2. Dark Souls 2. That trash. wasn't Miyazaki. That wasn't him? Dog. Okay, that makes more sense. That makes so much sense. Because no, dude, dark, dude, I'll die on this hill. Dark Souls Two is fucking hot garbage. It, dude. The fact that there's a stat, I didn't know this because I've never played Dark Souls. Adaptability. Souls-2. Adaptability. <laughs> Are you insane? The fact that the enemies can chase you forever and will keep chasing you until you have an entire horde of enemies chasing after you what are you talking about yeah why is every enemy look the same every single fucking boss is a knight yeah oh my god i've been playing since the first dark souls i've been hooked ever since and a lot of people have dude i mean fuck we have like a whole genre of elden ring death core now which is like i i can't even be upset about it right because it's like the stories contained within those games dude like just lend themselves to metal and death core oh my gosh my my wife has been telling me all about the lore within elden ring and bloodborne and i'm just oh yeah dude bloodborne dude you know who you should check out on um youtube a dude i watch like religiously whenever he drops a lore video he does like lore videos on all the souls likes uh vati video no vati video okay vati spelled v-a-a-t-i-v-i oh shoot he was the first guy got it yeah 
Dude. Whoa, look at how many subscribers. So like he'll go balls deep in depth on like just one fucking character, dude, contained within like the souls verse. Check out one of those videos. You'll be hooked. And his voice is like, oh, he talks about armored core. Fuck. Yes. Yeah, dude, that game's fucking go. Um, Have you ever played any of the old? I'm mean, sorry. I know we're supposed to be talking about. Uh, uh, nah, dude. It's Void Stare, but I'm gonna be honest with you. There talk ain't much else whatever. to talk about when it comes to uh, to Void Stare. We that it's very cut and dry what it is. Yeah. Um, that's honestly uh, for my next uh, album. I plan to make the last song like the the best song of the album. I promise you that it's gonna be like a fucking like a nine minute magnum opus. I'm I'm not even shitting you. It's gonna be. It's gonna be better than anything that I would. I, I'm gonna. It's gonna be amazing. I I even have like the idea of what the last song is gonna be and like what. That's it's good, dude. That's and the fact like... that everything that everything that is gonna all the songs previous are going to lead up to this last one and all the themes are going to come together all at once with this thing. I've already been thinking about this album so much. Anyways, we'll talk about after we're done talking about Armored Core. Have you played the other games before? Oh yeah, they're they're vastly different from Armored Core. We're on six now, right? Yeah, because yeah. this one is actually lends itself more to a Souls like where the originals don't. They're not oh, yeah. really they're not really in that vein. Oh yeah, but dude, this this Armored Core is fucking amazing, dude. It's so good. Oh dude, like. The fact that when I saw the trailer and I saw that there were like little little like big old bosses with like glowing weak spots and there were like little, little there was like the blade <laughs> Star Vo- that- Star Fox vibes intensify as Bro. Fuck, dude. <laughs> okay. The moment that I saw that there were like more than one type of like melee weapon because for the longest time the only melee weapon that was was like the the fucking like the blade where you go like that for the yeah, longest yeah, time. Yeah. That was the only one. And then they're like, oh wait a minute, let's let's we have Dark Souls experience. Let's make different types. Let's make an let's take a whip. Let's make a a, a a a a a blade that spins, bro. My favorite part of like playing this most recent uh entry of uh of Armored Core is the fact that it has like four endings oh fuck yeah yeah they, that was a very really thing to do vati did like a full like dude it's like a fuck what's five that hour. Like a four yeah five hour fucking lore video just on that game it's insane dude i would say like the the lore of that game doesn't uh isn't as interesting to me as, no, like, say, because it's Elden more about Ring. the world. It's more about the world than it is the characters. Yeah. Well, in Elden Ring, I like the idea of like this this pantheon of like gods and like yep. how different they are. And like Miyazaki's really good about obviously the berserk references, but there's more like the a lot of Lovecraft. I love the idea of like these outside forces just like coming in and influencing like different characters and like what form that takes. And so, yeah, Elden Ring's the go. Um, I don't think we need an Elden Ring, too. I don't know if it'd live up to it. Yeah, I no. don't know what's going to be next, man. I wish we could. uh we could have gotten like ourselves like legally down corrected for Bloodborne because, man, we need a remake of that game so quick. You know what, dude? Honestly, I know a lot of people complain and I think it's bullshit that not everybody can enjoy it because they don't have a a PlayStation or whatever. Um, But it still holds up like, dude, the the 30 FPS shit, like once you play for like a couple hours, dude, it's not even that big of a deal. Not even a couple hours. You get used to it within 30 minutes. It's just fucking PC Master Race fucking brain rot. But like Uh, totally. Totally. Which I, agree I have 100%. both. I have a PS5 and I have my P- PC. Obviously, I would love to have Bloodborne on the fucking PC. Yeah. See, but... you're at six. You're at sixty FPS, and I'm at thirty FPS. Well, see, I just have difference. a better camera than you, <laughs> and I also oh, you're better than me. Is that what it is? Huh? Huh? I mean, aesthetically, no. Like visually, as of right now, yes. Fair enough. No, that was a fun little rant. No, we can talk about whatever the fuck we want, dude. Um, yeah. But going back to the album, why did you choose Void Sayer as the closer for this? Was it did it just flow well, you think, in your brain? 
Because the way it opens from like Shadow's Maw to Valley of the Flies, and then you slow it down a little bit with Unfeathered, and I then honestly, it's super heavy in the middle. Honestly, I was trying to think about how it would work aesthetically because uh, I thought that since we come from like a really hard song, and then we go to like a softer one like Sun Messiah, and then we go to to uh, uh, one that's a little more upbeat uh, with Void Say. I was trying to think about it aesthetically. But honestly, I think that, that, you know, with how many people saying that, you know, it would have been better if it was a uh, if it was Sun Messiah. Yeah, I think that maybe that might have been the better call. But you know what? It is what it is. I don't mind. Honestly, it's like that would have just been like my like the cherry on top as far as like a preference goes. But like either way works, to be honest, it works out the same, dude. It's a stellar oh, yeah. album. Again, I think for one person to do this all of this just can't be understated i think you've worked your ass off i think it's phenomenal i hope you continue to create shit what else is in the future for oracle specter man i am currently yeah i'm currently working on a second album right now um i don't have i don't have a a name for it exactly so the idea is that the song it, or not the song sorry the album is basically going to be about where this alien this cosmic alien descends onto earth and it basically says to everyone hey y'all suck like really <laughs> like yeah. really suck i'm able to travel across entire galaxies within the amount of time it takes for you to breathe and i have observed multiple different different types of species and i think that for you guys you guys are the ones that i believe that i should intervene for once i never i don't usually intervene with any of any living life forces at all but you are the first one that i'm going to intervene with and i'm going to give you guys seven reasons why i'm going to throw you all away (laughs) now mind you now, mind you, your planet's going to be okay. The animals that live on it are going to be okay because they have a purpose on there. You don't. All you do is go around and just benefit from it. That's not even the first reason. I'll give you the first reason. And then he goes into the first, the second song, third song, fourth song, and it goes on. And by the ninth song, humanity collects itself. And there is one guy who they bring forward to represent humanity, to speak with this cosmic entity. And it is a very old man. And this this man, uh, he goes up to the cosmic entity. He says, hey, you know, everything you said about us is right. Everything you said about us is correct. That is, that is who we are. However, I would like to ask you a couple of questions. Who are you to play God to a species that you've never interacted with and you only have observed? You never got to understand the nuances behind all these reasons that you have given for us. You have yet to truly understand why we are the way that we are. And more importantly, as you've said, there are species on this planet that are older than us. Uh, We are still in our evolutionary infancy we still have a long ways to go to understand how things work and how to really get things together. So if there's anyone who should have the right to kill the humans, it's the humans themselves. If we are not meant to exist, we will do in of ourselves and do away with ourselves. You have seen countless species and you have seen them do extreme cosmic damage. However, I do want to say that you even intervening and speaking to us has proven that we there are things out there that are far outside of our understanding that we should not mess with. And to that, I thank you. The song is essentially just a a response to that. The last song is a response. Jesus Christ, dude, that's a that's a hell of a premise, dude. I we're getting some alien core, dude. Fuck yeah. In yeah, the, just... in the void of rings of Saturn. Thank God. Actually, uh, to, <laughs> it's funny. I'm not I'm not I'm not getting Lucas on it. I promise you. Yeah. But the, the other guy that I'm going to be uh, working with actually is uh, Mirar. OK. Because, because Does he delve in those themes as well? No, but his music really can sound almost eldritch in origin because of just how. Yeah. Yeah. Just how like almost ugly it can sound and abrasive and i love that i'm like dude that's i think that's exactly what i need i need something that can just 
encapsulate what each song is about and to kind of give you an idea on what uh, the seven songs are actually about, they're pertaining to the Mahatma Gandhi's uh, seven social sins. And okay. they are wealth without work, pleasure without conscience, uh, knowledge without action, commerce without morality, science without humanity, worship without sacrifice, and politics without principle. Well, looking forward to that. No, dude, I'm I'm genuinely happy that you've I think finding the stories that you want to tell, dude, is gonna continue to drive forward. And I think the music will fall into place. You know, sometimes you just gotta find something worth writing about. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And I think that'll continue to push you forward. Now that and we'll kind of close on this, I wanna offer you just like one critique, and I hope you take this understand that I'm saying this with love. Um, okay. I would say listening to the album, the one critique I would have is you have a lot to say because you want to paint pictures with your words. And I understand that. And you want to perfectly encapsulate and get across the point you're trying to convey. I think you just need to tighten up uh, your lyrics a little bit to just mm. allow it to flow a little better and work on your delivery. Sean has song. been talking to me about that. So other than that, I think the album is great, but that'd be like my one critique of it. Aside from all that, now that it's all said and done, it's out there, how do you feel about it? I get I don't know. I, I'm proud of it, but I guess I'm more uh, I guess I'm more indifferent because I know I can do better. Okay. Plus no, I guess fair. plus I guess it's also because I know that I am releasing three songs that I would believe in theory are better than the album in of itself. Yeah. Well, we're always striving to like, or at least for musical artists, I feel like you always want to strive to do better than your previous release, but obviously this tops your previous work. Um, in my opinion, I think you did a phenomenal job, dude. And I just, Thank you for this fucking banger, dude. I've been listening to it nonstop. I agree. I think it's one of the best uh, deathcore releases this year. And I don't think it's fair to call it cookie cutter bullshit. Like, even if like you're taking influence from things like Darko, from Surgeon, you told me you were, you know, looking at Jake's project Surgeon for some influence and inspiration. And while I can see like maybe little moments of that i think this really is just uniquely you it's mm. uniquely oracle specter i personally don't win call it cookie cutter so another critique i'll offer you dude is all the critiques some of them don't mean shit you don't have to you know take everyone at their word some can be taken with a grain of salt so you know just be mindful yeah. of can I learn something from this criticism, but also have some confidence in, you know, what you do, because what you're doing is fucking dope, dude. Thank you. Yeah. Anyways, everybody, this was Oracle Spectre, a.k.a. Josh Rivero, um, talking about his new album, Deceivers, that came out uh, April 29th. Anyways, dude, I don't want to take more of your time. This was fun, dude. Thanks for fucking doing this, despite my brother uh, being on vacation, dude, and just chatting. Fucking with me, piece of shit, taking time off to go enjoy spending time with his family or something like that. Fucking asshole, dude. <laughs>